Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1984 Christmas horror movie, Silent Night, Deadly Night. And yes, I watched it on DVD. Uh, funny thing, I've actually had this dual uh, pack DVD of Silent Night, Deadly Night 1 and Part 2. And it had been um, still factory sealed for years. I've had this for probably 10 years or more and had never opened it up. And I had never seen any of the Silent Night, Deadly Nights, except for the second one, because of when Joe Bob did it for, I think, was it last year's Christmas special or the year before that? Recent Christmas special, basically. So um, I am actually going to run through every single one of the Silent Night, Deadly Night films. And for four of them, it'll be my first time experiencing them, including the first one, which, after my first watch, it's a fun time. I really did enjoy this film. I should just put this down because it's probably just making extra noise now. Okay, so getting into it. Uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night from 1984, directed by Charles E. Sellier Jr., who also did films Encounter with Disaster, Snowballing, and The Annihilators, uh, just to name a few. Written by Michael Hickey and based on a book by Paul Kamini, or Kami, Kami, got it, C-A-I-M-I, Kami. Um, it says it in the beginning of the film, but apparently there's some people who are kind of questioning if it was actually a book by this person or it was just kind of a vague idea that came to fruition. Whatever. It's credited in the film, so there you go. The working title for this film was actually Sleigh Ride, all one word. That's good. I, I think that's all great, but honestly, Silent Night, Deadly Night, I think is better. It's more fun of a title. Um, came out the same weekend as the original Nightmare on Elm Street and actually fared pretty well for the very first weekend. Then after that, it started dropping a lot. But apparently, uh, it it did good up against Nightmare on Elm Street considering that it was in a on a lot less screens than Nightmare on Elm Street was. The release was protested by angry parents who didn't like seeing Santa Claus depicted as a murderer. I'm sure a lot of people who are familiar with this film already know about that whole thing. People will get angry about just about anything, and I, I, I'm guessing, especially in this case, that they didn't watch the film. That people just saw a trailer or heard about the premise of the film and were like, I'm murdering Santa Claus, no way, now we're angry, you shouldn't do that. But if you actually watch the film, it's not a murdering Santa Claus. It's not like they're saying it's the actual Santa Claus, it's showing the mental trauma and breakdown of a person who has a bad association with Santa Claus that's all because of other grown-ups, not anything actually having to do with Santa Claus. It could have been anything. It could have been the Easter Bunny. It could have been, a, you know, a leprechaun. It could have been anything. So, but those are different films. Six minutes were actually cut from the film originally to avoid the X rating, and when they were restored later, they didn't look as well because they weren't properly stored, so their condition kind of degraded over time. Now, this version that I watched, this is the unrated version, so you can tell what the cut scenes were, not just because usually they have more gore, but because they look very yellow. Uh, the quality definitely takes a big step down when those little portions pop in, and it looks pretty yellow. So it takes you out of the film a little bit because the quality is not so great, but there were some really great gore scenes that had originally been cut, uh, probably the best of which was when they're doing a flashback much later in the film and Billy's remembering back to when his mother was murdered by a Santa Claus. Uh, they show the, the throat slitting, so it looks good. Uh, Sam Raimi was reportedly uh, considered for directing this film. Now, whenever I hear stuff like that, whether it's true or not, it just sends my mind off spinning and thinking about what would that film be like. Think about what a Sam Raimi-directed uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night would be. Probably pretty crazy. The camera work certainly would have been even more interesting. Not that the camera work was bad in this. I actually think that the directing was done well. The cinematography was good. For the most part, the acting was pretty solid, too. Uh, the guy who played Billy did did well for the role. It's a demanding role. Um, so in the beginning, as soon as the, blo the animated blood splatter covers the wreath in this, uh, and then the title appears, I was like, uh, I'm excited already. Because that's a very 80s thing, especially the way they did the, the animation on it. And it just made me think, 
here we go, splatter fest, it's going to be fun. It just got me excited, especially because I'm watching this in December, and, you know, we're in the holiday spirit, and I'm all about horror, so putting those two things together, even better. Nothing like Christmas at the mental health facility. Yes, in the beginning we see that they are driving to the mental health facility to see Grandpa. Um, it just made me feel like, ooh, yeah, this is a way to set up a film, I guess. Um, we're going to see Grandpa, and then you find out he's in a mental health facility, and then you're just kind of like, oh, I see the tone of this film. I see where we're going with it. And then I put down, oh man, the grandfather is super creepy, and he does the right level of over the top. Now, he, obviously when they first show up, he's catatonic, so he's not really doing any interacting or anything like that. But once he starts speaking to Billy when everyone's gone, which I question whether that was supposed to be real or not. Because I kind of think that may have just been in Billy's head. I could see it playing out either way because of how catatonic he is. And then he just, like, snaps out of it when it's just Billy. So I honestly do think that it was something that Billy just, you know, made up in his mind, which would actually plant the seed of showing early on that there's already some sort of uh, psychiatric situation going on with Billy, even before the, tra the trauma of his parents being killed at the hands of a, you know, criminal Santa Claus who just murdered someone for $31. But yeah. But I, I do think that that wasn't actually Grandpa talking. I think that was all in Billy's head uh, because it seemed too much of like a switch going with him being totally catatonic and then him delivering all these lines to Billy. But super creepy the way he delivered them. Um, like I said, it was like the perfect level of over the top and ridiculous that like it's still believable and it's still like creepy and unsettling and I liked it. You can see how, how Billy would believe the grandfather's mad rant, and since he's so young, he just trusts adults. That's another thing. He's he's very much set up in this film to go down this path of believing that Santa Claus will actually murder people uh, for being naughty <laughs> because he's, you know, reading the books and everything, and then he, you know, has this talk, talk with his grandfather that is very unsettling to him, then the trauma happens... And then he's in the orphanage, and the nuns are further hitting home this whole thing of morality of naughty versus nice. And if you're naughty, you get punished. And it just keeps going and going and going. And he's assaulted with it so much throughout his life that the journey becomes believable within the world created in this film. So I think it was written pretty well, honestly. They pulled it off pretty well. Based off, oh, I already said that one. When they roll up on that Santa Claus with his broken down car, you're basically like, no, 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 no. Don't stop right now. Do not stop right now. Like, you feel it as an audience member. You see that Santa Claus standing, uh, you know, in the middle of the road, kind of waving to them. And you're just like, you keep going, keep going. And then obviously everything goes to hell. And the parents are killed at, with in a brutal, brutal ways, and not only does Billy witness it, but Ricky witnesses it too, but you kind of tend to forget that Ricky witnessed it as well, just because the film is so focused on Billy and Billy's journey, but you're reminded of that at the very end of the film when it has that kind of stinger at the end where it's like the zoom in on Billy and Billy's like, punish, so you're just like, oh yeah, he went through the exact same stuff basically, so maybe he too will turn out like Billy. What Billy witnesses is certainly a lasting impression of Santa Claus, I wrote down. Uh, not a good lasting impression, obviously, but it it is a lasting impression. Probably more lasting an impression than anyone who has a favorable opinion or favorable experience uh, having to do with Santa Claus. I don't know what's worse, that Billy's at an orphanage or that mullet on his skull. Yes, he has a fantastic mullet when you see him a little bit older in the orphanage and you're just like, yeah, this was the eighties. <laughs> this was certainly the eighties, man. Oh man. When Billy sees the couple having sex in the orphanage, it appears the naked breasts trigger his awful memory because he's, he sees the breasts and then he gets that flashback of when his mother's blouse was popped open, um, when she was being attacked. And so that makes you think that that's going to be the trigger point going forward. That when naked breasts are seen, it's just like he's going to start having these flashbacks, having a traumatic experience. 
Then when the nun tells him that what he saw was naughty and will always be punished, it brings validity to the story of uh, the story of Santa Claus that his grandfather told him, or told him, as I'm supposing. But yeah, she's then reinforcing it. So like I was saying before, it's been reinforced again. So the whole naughty or nice thing that he learns initially, then it is taken to a disturbing level with his grandfather, then an even more disturbing level with the Santa Claus who kills his parents. Then the nun is reiterating it as he's trying to get over the trauma once he starts to be re-traumatized by seeing those people having sex. And she nails it home with the whole naughty versus nice thing, showing the mantra of Santa Claus of naughty versus nice being what he saw in essence. And then he may even think at that point that maybe his parents were murdered because they were naughty somehow. Because he doesn't know at that point that that wasn't the real Santa Claus, I don't think. I love it when Billy Coldcocks that Santa at the orphanage. <laughs> that was pretty funny. I didn't see it coming. Like, I thought he would, like, cry or, like, yell or, like, cause a scene or something. But I didn't see him just, like, coldcocking the Santa and him falling back. That was a good scene. I like that. The development of Billy's Santa issue is more extensive than I actually thought it was going to be in the film. I thought it would have been uh, more simplistic because a lot of 80s films, the writing wasn't the best. Now, you can say that you can watch this film and be like, yeah, it's campy. It's not like an amazing film. But if you consider the writing of it and how slowly they took the progression of Billy and his traumatic experience and his mental state and the breakdown thereof le reading up, leading up to the rampage, um, it's pretty well paced and it's pretty well written. So... I'm in, and I wasn't expecting that from this film. Once Billy has to don the red suit at that toy store, uh, he starts to turn into the version of Santa that he personally knows. So he's been trying to keep his distance from Santa Claus for so long because of all the trauma, obviously. But once he's asked to basically imbue Santa, and he's encouraged to do that by the people at the toy store because he's supposed to act like Santa to the kids. Well, his version of what he knows as Santa is totally different than everyone else. And so he is being asked to do this. And he's been a very compliant kid, which you can see from being at the orphanage. He's constantly told, you know, if you're naughty, you'll be punished. You know, you do what, what grownups ask of you. And you see that when he starts working at the toy store. You know, he's very obedient. He does everything that the toy store owner asks him to. So when he's told to be Santa Claus... He says yes, because he's been saying yes to adults all his life. So he takes on the role of Santa Claus as he knows him. Now, obviously, there's that one trigger moment that actually kicks it off, but he starts the progression of becoming Santa Claus as soon as he puts the suit on. And you can see that starting when he's looking at himself in the mirror. You know the rampage is coming, but you kind of want them to get there a little bit faster, especially during the whole like after-hours party that they were having while they were drinking at the toy store. Yeah, it, it took a little bit too long to get there. I thought the pacing was a little bit slow at that point. For the most part, pacing is pretty good in this film, but during that point, I was just like, okay, you know, we all know where this is going. We can move it a little bit. And the film's not long. It's like, in, like an hour and 25 minutes or something. Strangling Andy with the Christmas lights is a solid start to the rampage of killing, but how was Billy actually holding him in the air with one arm? Um... That makes absolutely no sense. Yeah, it looks kind of cool, but I guess, like, in his traumatized, like, phased-out state, he's got, like, super strength or something. Like, it just seems ridiculous, and there's so many other things you could have done in that sense. I mean, you even could have had him still strangle him with the Christmas lights, but, like, take him to the ground and do it, you know? Like, holding him all the way up, I, I just don't, I don't understand it. Um, Mr. Sims with the, the, the toy store owner... Mr. Sims with the hammer sticking out of his head is a pretty nice scene when that one lady kind of goes into the back room and sees him just, like, laying there with it, the claw of the hammer sticking out of his head. Pretty nice. Uh, I really like that one. I dig the nightmarish music that was playing and them showing close-ups of various toys while the rampage is going on. It adds to the feeling that all of Christmas has basically been tainted by this murder spree that Billy started. It's... So it's not looking like an isolated incident. It starts to make it feel like all of Christmas is being affected, even these toys as they're kind of sitting there and watching, witnessing the rampage that's going on. So I like the way that's done. 
If you see Linnea Quigley show up in an 80s film, you know that her boobs are coming out. No exception with this film. That's exactly what happens. I mean, it was just kind of like the rule. Those are the roles that she did back then. So yeah, it happens again. But what we end up getting is an amazing scene of her being mounted on those deer antlers. That's a phenomenal scene. It's really, really cool. I could believe that Billy could pick her up with two arm, with two hands, so I like that aspect of it. But it's an excellently messed up visual, visual that looks good after he's lifted her up and nailed her onto those antlers. But also the one of the deleted scenes that's in this unrated cut, you see the antlers starting to come through her stomach out the front, and that is also a cool moment. In the scene with the little girl talking to Billy as if he's the real Santa Claus, you can tell that he wants a reason to kill her. Uh, once he basically gets started killing, he wants to keep killing. He is a murderer at heart because of what he went through at this point. Um, but, and, you know, he had been fighting it for so long, but that trauma basically created this murderous situation. So once he starts the rampage, he doesn't want to stop. And so you see him intentionally, like, really pressing this little girl about, are you, were you really good? Have you always been nice? You know, you sure you weren't naughty? And instead of actually killing her with the box cutter, which he wanted to do, he just hands the bloody box cutter to her. Because he's like, oh, well, I guess at this point she hasn't admitted to doing anything bad, and I don't know anything bad that she's done that I just, I gotta give her something. It's a present. I actually like that you don't see the the decapitation jesus <laughs> i actually like that you don't see the decapitation of the one sled thief on that scene uh it is way way cooler the way they put it i mean yes you could have had it where like you see the axe kind of lop his head off and it goes flying and that would have been cool and i felt a little bit like let down that they didn't show that until they did the reveal and i think it's way better this way where the sled comes down and the friend sees him and it's just a headless body on the sled and you're like, oh, that's cool. And then it's that next level when the head comes rolling down the hill after the sled with the headless body. Love the way that was pulled off. That may be my favorite scene in the film. Very well done. I don't think the one nun's response to the cop shooting Santa is at the level that it really should have been. The Santa Claus that was actually uh, a priest um, that cop just shows up, you know, sees a Santa, shoots him in the back and everything. And the nun, the nun is just like, okay, kids, come inside, come inside. I guess she may have been trying to stay calm to like not alarm the kids. I assume that's, that's what the purpose was. But, um, can you really control it like that in a situation like that? You just saw the priest that you work with get shot to death. I mean, come on. And it is kind of hilarious that they shot and killed the priest instead of Billy. I do think that's kind of fun. And it kind of takes on this level, which this was very common in the 80s and 90s. In film, cops were idiots a lot of the time. And that just adds that little aspect of like idiot cop thing. Uh, it's just something that was done in films a lot back then. They're always like bumbling idiots. A nice surprise when Billy pops around the corner and axes that cop. Um, the way that they have him like going down into like that basement area with all the machinery, you really do feel it building tension and you feel like at any moment Billy could pop out and try to kill this guy or successfully kill him. But once he starts leaving and there's, there's no one down there, you're kind of like, oh, okay, well then where is he? And then he just, you don't even have time to like finish that thought. He pops right out and just whacks him in the, ch I think it was the chest, no, stomach with the axe and that's a cool scene because he then goes falling backwards down the stairs great scene as well there it's kind of a sad ending to this as billy dies and says to the kids that they're all safe from santa claus now um that's really all he ever really wanted in life um at that point he basically they have gotten what he always wanted he always wanted santa claus to go away because of his experience with him and who he thought santa claus was so he, I, I viewed his kind of speech to the kids as he was dying as like a, here you go, like this is what I wished I had that I am telling you now you have. Santa Claus is dead. You don't have to fear, you don't have to have this fear any longer because he lived in fear of Santa Claus for his entire life. So I like that kind of ending and it is kind of sad like I was saying because of that. 
And the final moment is supposed to be the indicator that Ricky could end up being just like his brother. Now, at this point, I've seen the second one, but I don't remember much any, any met much of anything from it. Although, from what I know, a majority of it is just recut stuff from this film, so it's basically the same thing. But as I go on, I'm interested to see if Ricky does come into play, and they do just take Ricky and have Ricky do the Billy thing. Don't tell me in the comments. Do not tell me that. I'm going to find out myself. The film is interesting because Billy isn't just a simple psycho killer. You see how he became traumatized so that when he does lose it, you actually feel a little bit conflicted. Because at that point, yes, he's going on a murderous rampage, but you understand how he got to that point. You understand that it's not all his fault and he didn't really choose to go there, that something just snapped and switched. So you still feel for him to a degree. He's still an innocent in a way, in your mind as an audience member. At least that's how I felt watching it. But then you're seeing him do this horrific stuff to innocent people, and he it's, it's horrifying at the same time. So you feel so conflicted, and I like how they pulled that off. If you think about it, this is the ultimate 80s slasher because of Santa's naughty and nice mantra, uh, which literally is what was being done with slashers in the 80s. It was all about the people who die, or usually the teenagers who die, or die because they did something naughty. You know, they're having sex, they're doing drugs, they're drinking, stuff like that. Those are the people who were killed, and those were kind of the rules of 80s slasher films. So, based off that, this really is the ultimate 80s slasher film, because it's incorporating the actual mantra of naughty and nice which the slasher had adopted at the time, but under the guise of Santa Claus, who was using it way earlier than slashers. I guess you could say Krampus, because it's kind of like Santa's on the good side and Krampus is on the naughty side, so them working together. So, anyway, um, obviously I enjoyed this film. I had a good time with it. Uh, out of five stars with half stars in play, ooh, I'm, mm, I'm actually going to give it a four-star rating. So I was between three and a half and four, but I'm going to bump it up to the four because I think the writing is quite good. There are some things that they could have done to kind of like made it a little tighter as a film and, you know, made it even more engaging. But honestly, the way that story is written and kind of like the slow progression of Billy's character and you understanding how he got to where he did and then that bloody revenge or that bloody rampage payoff, it's pretty good. So, four stars for Silent Night, Deadly Night. I'm assuming that this is the highest I'm going to end up giving any of the Silent Night, Deadly Night films, but I'm interested to find out because I know that down the line, Brian Usna was involved with one or two of the films. So, I'm very interested to see how that comes out. But, what are your thoughts on Silent Night, Deadly Night? Go ahead and put some comments down there. Do you love it, hate it, in between? Let me know. Is this your favorite Christmas horror film? And if not, what is your favorite Christmas horror film or holiday horror film for this time period? Whatever you celebrate. But um, yeah, this is a good time. Do me a quick favor, though. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. If you have already, you are amazing. If you haven't, it is quick, painless, costs you zero dollars, and really does keep me motivated to keep doing these videos. At this moment, I don't get paid through YouTube or anything to do this. So um, motivation is everything <laughs> to just keep going. Uh, it's, a, it's a good creative outlet for me, but um, what really satisfies me most is when I see new people subscribing because I know that someone sound, found something that they enjoyed to some degree. So please subscribe. Also hit the notification bell button because then you'll know when I'm putting up new videos if you're interested in checking them out as soon as you can because I'm usually putting up about four videos a week anyway. So yeah, but regardless... Thank you so much for taking your time to watch this. Look forward to the last or the other four Silent Night, Deadly Night reviews as they're coming. And until next time, keep it brutal.